the slope, the slope of the IS curve, right? Is it very steep? Is it very flat? Is it somewhere in the middle? Something we refer to as elasticity, right? So how steep or flat the IS curve is depends upon the values of little c and little d in our equation, the consumption and investment elasticities of real interest, right? These guys right here, they're what determine the slope along with the denominator, which is something we're not going to change. Now, what does it mean to be off the curve? Hmm. So let's suppose that we start at a real interest rate of R0. Y0, of course, will be the equilibrium level on the IS curve. But suppose we're at point B. So what does point B mean for us? Now, recall that in every other model that we've looked at, when we weren't in equilibrium, there were economic forces that would come to bear to bring us back to equilibrium. That will be true here as well. So when we're not on the IS curve, the thing that we want to think about is what does it mean to be a point B, which tells us we have an income level or an output level of YB. First thing that tells us, Y sub B is actual real GDP, actual real spending, actual real economic output, actual production. So remember, actual is always, think of it as production. It tells us how much we're producing. But you can see we're not in equilibrium. We're producing more than an interest rate of R0 wants us to buy. So in this case, we're producing way up here, say 1,000 units a week, but we're only selling something less than that, 800, 900 units a week. So what happens to the difference between production and sales? Inventories go up, right? Now, suppose you're running a little business making your widgets, and every week you notice your storeroom's getting fuller and fuller and fuller. You're still making a lot of widgets, but you're not selling nearly as many. So now you got to go out and rent another storage locker, and then a third, a fourth, and a fifth. So what do you do as a business person? You decrease production, right? And how do you decrease production? You lay off workers, or you reduce the number of hours that your workers are toiling away, being the sweatshop owners that you are. Um, and guess what? When you lay them off or you reduce their work hours, you pay them less. So their incomes go down. So as their incomes go down, their spending will go down as well. Marginal propensity to consume. So what we see then is a movement back to the left until we get back to equilibrium. So everything, every Every point to the right of the IS curve represents excess production and rising inventories, unplanned inventories. Everything to the left of the IS curve would reflect excess demand, and inventories will be falling. In order to deal with that situation, you need to have your workers put in more hours. You need to hire additional workers. You need to pay them more. Incomes go up. And economic activity goes up along with it. So remember, the IS curve is equilibrium. The economy is going to have natural economic forces that want to bring it back to equilibrium. If we're off the IS curve, it's typically inventory investment, rising or falling, that is uh, motivating business people to change their production uh, schedules by adding or reducing the size of their workforce and the size of their payrolls. Now, the IS curve can also shift. Right? Now, it will shift when there's a change in any of the variables, any of the variables that were in the numerator of the first component of our equation. Right? And we had seven. Autonomous consumption, investment, government purchases, net exports, foreign economic activity, financial frictions, autonomous taxes. Right? Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, how about that? Must have been looking at this slide when I did the other one. Okay. So changes in any of these variables or any combination of these variables will cause the IS curve to shift. Now, the little pluses and minuses in here simply reflect, do they, an increase in autonomous consumption would cause the IS curve to shift to the right or up, right? They'll move in the same direction. Negative signs mean just the opposite. Okay. So here we can look at a delta on one or more of these variables or the delta on the whole numerator. And what we want to see then is what effect does that have on economic output? Right? What effect does that have? We will be holding the real interest rate and the real exchange rate constant. So let's just take an example. Let's suppose that we want to increase autonomous government uh, purchases by $100 billion. And let's set a real interest rate level and assume we started in equilibrium. So this increase in government purchases is going to cause economic output to rise. At any real interest rate level, economic output will be higher, rising to Y1. Again, remember, we're holding the real interest rate and the real exchange rate constant. So we can now see the change in economic output. And the question we then would want to ask ourselves is, is the change in economic output greater than, equal to, 
or less than the change in government purchases. And the way that we can answer that question is to come back to our equation, see what's happened. That is, we could calculate the change in economic output by the change in government purchases. And if we calculate that, we will get the following result. 1 divided by 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume times 1 minus the tax rate plus the marginal propensity to import. Now, for reasonable values of the marginal propensity to consume, say 0.9 for the U.S., the marginal tax rate, 0.2, 0.3, and the marginal propensity to import, about 0.2, the denominator will be less than 1, which means that this expression will be greater than 1. I'll let you figure it out from those numbers. Which means that economic output rises by more than the increase in government purchases. We'll see later, this is not always true that it rises by more, but in an economic situation like we have in the United States today, it is uh, almost always true. Okay? We'll talk about some exceptions later. Okay, so this, this expression, 1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume times 1 minus the tax rate plus the marginal propensity to import, is known as the expenditure multiplier. The expenditure multiplier. It tells us, for any change in autonomous expenditures, how big a change in economic output we will get. As I mentioned, for reasonable values, this number will be greater than 1. So we need to think about why that's the case, which means we need to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that denominator term. So what we want to find is we have initial change in expenditures, right? $100 billion by the government. So what happens next? So if the government wants to, say, repair all the roads for $100 billion, what they need to do is hire a bunch of construction workers and buy a bunch of construction supplies. Well, that means that those workers now have a paycheck that they didn't have before, and those businesses now have business that they didn't have before. So their incomes went up by $100 billion. Whatever the government spends becomes income to whoever receives it. Well, what happens to the recipients of the income? The first thing they have to do is pay their taxes, right? That's that little t. 1 minus the marginal tax rate tells us how much of our income is left. So let's suppose the tax rate is 20%. So if we had income go up by $100 billion, because that's what the government spent, then that means after we've paid our taxes, we have $80 billion left over, 1 minus T times 100. And what do we do with that increase in our disposable income? We spend it, but we spend it based on the marginal propensity to consume, which we'll assume is 0.9. So we had $80 billion of disposable income. Now we spend 90% of that, or $72 billion. But when we spend that $72 billion in the grocery store, at the restaurant, uh, at the bookstore, wherever it might be, it increases the income of the recipients. Notice, we had spending of 100 to begin with. We had a second round of spending of $72 billion. So total spending has now gone up by $172 billion. And if we work that out, oh, by the way, we, some of what we spend will be imported goods, so we have to pull out the imports as well. But keep doing this, what we find is the total expenditures, that is total economic output, will be larger than the $100 billion increase in government purchases. Now, again, we'll talk about some exceptions to this uh, later in the term when we talk more specifically about fiscal policy. In this analysis, the real interest rate does not change. And, of course, in the real world, the real interest rate does change. So that will be one of the corrections that we will have to make. Now, the example I just gave you was for an increase in government purchases. But this would be equally true for an increase in autonomous consumption, autonomous net exports, or autonomous investment. In the short run, a dollar spent is exactly the same as any other dollar spent. We've seen that's not necessarily true in the long run. But in the short run, the size of the capital stock does not change very much, so we don't have to worry about that in the course of a year or two or three. Now, rather than increase government spending, we could have reduced taxes. So let's think about what would happen here if we were to reduce autonomous taxes by $100 billion. So notice that autonomous taxes show up over here in that first component of our IS curve equation. But notice here that the $100 billion is going to be multiplied by the marginal propensity to consume. When we change taxes, we change disposable income first. The change in disposable income then causes a change in expenditures through the marginal propensity to consume. So this reduction in taxes... will also cause the IS curve to shift to the right, and it will also cause economic output to rise. And we can calculate, again, the change in output that's brought about by this change in autonomous taxes. And what we would see is it comes out to minus the marginal propensity to consume divided by 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume times 1 minus the tax rate plus the marginal propensity to import. Because of that marginal propensity to consume in the numerator, in the simple analysis, this so-called tax multiplier would be smaller in value than the expenditure multiplier that we just saw for government purchases. Okay. So if we come back to our equation that we look at, whoops. when we come back to our equation, if we want to see what effect the change in autonomous components would have on economic output, consumption, autonomous consumption, autonomous investment, autonomous government purchases, and autonomous taxes is simply the straight expenditure multiplier. 
if we're talking about financial frictions, foreign economic activity, or the autonomous taxes, we also need to take into consideration that there's a parameter in front of each one of those variables. So we need to also have that sensitivity to changes in those variables in place as well. Okay, so that's it for today. So make sure you memorize that IS curve.